another great interview guest here. Really excited to be speaking with uh, Dr. Sean Conway, uh, who is tuning in right now from uh, South Africa. Um, and yeah, we'll be talking a lot about um, sustainable DeFi, about um, impacts uh, to also the um, ecological impact that we could have with blockchain technology and also what role Cosmos plays in all of that. Um, so yeah, I'm really excited to learn a lot. Um, this is a project that just came on my radar a couple of weeks ago and um, in the process right now of launching. So first things first, uh, thank you, uh, Sean, so much for taking the time. How is everything going? Yeah, <clears throat> besides not getting much sleep, everything's going really, really well. Uh, there's there's kind of a perfect storm of good things happening. And, um, you know, it's, it's all leading to um, a really great launch, a great uh, activation of the community, um, creating the possibilities for people to gain a stake um, and really moving forward a movement, I would say which has been something we've been working on. I've personally been working on this more than a decade, um, specifically on the vision that we've now implemented and are taking to the next phase. Uh, so it's been a long journey. A lot of people haven't really um, heard about XO. We've been kind of under the radar. Um, we've been a, um, a part of the Cosmos community really since the beginning, um, but, uh, but, but now we're, you know, our time has come, I guess. Yeah, that's awesome. <clears throat> it's great to see also more and more fundamental infrastructure projects that are launching on Cosmos and adding value to the whole ecosystem, implementing IBC, right? There's all these mm. elements. I think um, I'm, I'm quite new to the Cosmos community, I would say, but I see it's all kind of like coming together what has been built out over the past years. Um, and you already said it, you're waiting for this for 10 years. And uh, I was uh, looking a little bit on your on your LinkedIn also. You've, you've been working and advising for um, health institutions, for the WHO, for the UNICEF, for the World Bank and the UK Department for International Development. So you have a very, very strong background from that niche, or not, well, not niche, but from that whole industry, actually. Mm -hmm. um, so can you talk a little bit about how you, like what you did before kind of like entering the Cosmoverse and crypto and how it kind of like led to that? Because that's quite an exotic transition, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it, it is. I mean, I, I consider myself to be fortunate to have had more than one life in one lifetime so far. Um, and I started my career as a medical doctor at a time when um, early on in my career, we were facing the very start of the HIV AIDS epidemic. And it was particularly bad in sub-Saharan Africa and particularly in South Africa. And there was, wasn't really much going on about it. So, so here I was a, a, a young doctor um, starting to work. Actually, uh, I was becoming an ophthalmologist. I was doing eye surgery and so on. And seeing more and more patients who uh, were presenting with the signs of AIDS. And there was nothing we could do. There was no treatment. There was really, there was no, there were no systems. And so I, I launched myself into that challenge. And um, so for a decade of my life, I was, I would say, at the leading edge of treatment access and, um, and global uh, initiatives, as well as then implementing projects on the ground um, for the next um, 15 years, um, enabling people to access uh, the treatments and so on. And, and that brought me, I think, into a couple of areas of really relevant um, experience that has informed where I am now. Um, the one was around how we create consensus and standardization and systems that enable us to scale. So one of the problems at the start of the epidemic was that um, the, the belief was that each person who received antiretroviral treatment, which was uh, only starting to become available, wasn't widely available, but that it had to be tailored and had to be specific to each individual. And of course, trying to scale that customization was, was a huge challenge. Uh, that was solved by a process of consensus around standardized treatment and combination pills and things like that. So actually technologies that um, were pharmaceutical technologies, but at the same time, economic technologies, um, um, business technologies, social technologies, et cetera, that all came together to make that possible to really scale up to millions of people uh, that uh, were going to die of AIDS and, and then receive treatment. Um, the, the other part of it was really about um, how we build systems and the information that we use in those systems. So at the start of the epidemic, there was a lot of um, ignorance and, and also because of fear and denial, uh, lack of information about who was infected, where the infections were increasing and so on, and very little data. And so I started to get into this data problem 
And uh, I, you know, I'm a kind of computer geek from from like my from when I was a kid. Um, and uh, so really started to look at like how can we get better data systems um, in order to improve how we gain access to treatment and use the, uh, the, uh, the, the data, for instance, to make the case for how we could create closed loop, loop systems um, so that medicines could be provided preferential prices. Um, uh, and that kind of went on to uh, projects that I got involved in later on around uh, medicines pricing and market shaping. Um, so through creating transparency around medicines prices, enabling um, a better price um, pricing in the market for medicines. So I led a regional program on access to medicines in Southern Africa. Um, and the other initiative was around um, uh, accountability. So there's a, a big international health partnership, um, which Gordon Brown in his short stint as a prime minister launched this with all of the leaders on, on his, um, in, in, in the, uh, Downing Street. And um, this was about committing to um, improving the efficiency and coordination and, and alignment and, um, and results of the funding that was available going into the Millennium Development Goals for the, um, for the uh, health uh, goals that were behind track. And so we were contracted to run a big accountability initiative, which was collecting data across the world and trying to uh, translate this into scorecards, which would then hold everyone accountable from you know, World Bank to UK government, all the way to you know, country governments and civil society organizations. And that was quite an effective um, program. And it's shifted the paradigm around you know, how you use information for accountability and transparency. But in the process, it became really evident that the information was pretty you know, crap. I mean, it was just, you know, the, the, the information, the data that we had available was all in all of these siloed systems and, um, and there was a lot of double counting and really just terrible data systems. And so, you know, that led to the next phase of my journey, sort of thinking about, okay, how do we improve these data systems? Um, and uh, <clears throat> I was given the platform <clears throat> around 2008 to speak at a conference and it was just around the time when Web 2.0 was becoming kind of a thing. And so I was asked to speak about how I would see uh, the potential of this new web technology um, uh, improving the situation in international development. And so I, I gave this presentation about an idea um, and there's a slide share on it from 2008, um, which pretty much described what we've implemented. So it was decentralized. It was um, stakeholder driven with, uh, at, at that stage, we didn't have the concept of tokens, but it was um, around these eco credits. Everyone would get eco credits that would participate in this mechanism. If um, results were achieved, then they would, they would get a greater share of the eco credits and would have a greater say in, in then steering uh, projects forward. Um, so essentially describing decentralized autonomous organizations, um, mechanisms such as tokenization, curation, um, and the things that have, have now just become second nature to us within the blockchain space. And, and how did you then, so that was 2008, how did you then get into um, the Cosmoverse? I guess it was like probably seven, eight years uh, later, right? Yeah, so, so, um, so I, I, I tried to implement these ideas round about, uh, so I was very busy with the, a couple of other programs that, I've, that I mentioned, um, till about 2012, 2011. And um, try to implement this using um, um, Cyclos, which is a, a local currency ledger. And I thought that might work um, because, uh, you know, we were trying to get um, financial flows and information data flows onto the same ledger and to do that at a localized level. But it soon became you know, evident to me that that, that wasn't going to work because somebody has to hold that ledger. You know, who trusts that that? Um, you know, that custodian of the data and of the, and of the economic mechanisms. And so I kind of like let that go. And then in 2013, um, discovered um, the, you know, the famous white paper um, uh, and, and Bitcoin. And it was like this instant light bulb moment for me. I, I, was, I was actually on vacation um, in Sri Lanka and I was, <laughs> I was on a, a, a hammock and it was one of those moments where I kind of trying to jump out of the hammock and go and shouting to the world saying, Hey, I think I've got it. And there's no one to hear me, but um, but it, it, it was this light bulb moment thinking, okay, if we had this ledger system where we can embed data and transaction flows on the same ledger, then we can do some powerful things with it. And so <clears throat> immediately started investigating how to implement this. And um, really the choices at the time 
where Bitcoin or uh, or Bitcoin, there were a couple of Bitcoin kind of derivatives um, or Ripple. And because of the date of uh, transaction numbers and and costs and so on, even back then, it seemed so sensible to build it on Ripple, which is which is what we did. Um, and then when Ethereum came along, then we transitioned to Ethereum and we had some proof of concepts around um, around Ethereum. We got the first uh, grant from the, U the UNICEF Innovation um, Department uh, to implement um, our first proof of concept, which is around tracking um, a subsidy scheme for um, children attending preschool. Um, so a government scheme and just, uh, when children attend, then tracking that against payments. So really creating an accounting system around that. Um, and uh, and and so we had eighty thousand children a day, all you know, uh, being tracked on the on this chain, and there were no level two solutions and so on. And so we started to look at more um, data friendly check technologies and started working with uh, Trent McConaughey and his team at Big Chain DB, and and started to do a, an, an implementation with Big Chain DB. And they were then looking at um, the consensus layer, and uh, they were experimenting with Tendermint. And that's kind of the entry point. Yeah. So we, we then got into Cosmos, started building on Cosmos, and we ran our first. Um, Cosmos chain uh, launched it uh, at the end of 2018, and that ran actually all the way till the middle of 2019 before we upgraded to our next version. Um, so yeah, and then really kind of got more deeply involved um, from 2019 in the Cosmos community. Yeah, and I think also then with with the launch of IBC, there was probably another major um, technical development or milestone that helped you guys to kind of like get closer to your vision. Um, which is to build the internet of impact, right? Um, yeah. And um, also, like you mentioned earlier, um, I think this is actually the biggest revolution in blockchain and the kind of like DLT space as a whole is that you have a public, publicly verifiable ledger that nobody can change, nobody can um, roll back, nobody can tamper. I think this is very, very powerful that applies to so much more than just you know, having those very high APYs, we all love DeFi, we all love uh, JPEGs, we all love trading them and the apes and the penguins, but I think there's much more that we can do in the longer run. Um, so um, can you talk a little bit about that, that vision that you guys have building the internet of impact, what it means um, and how you plan to eventually get there and build this? Yeah, so so the I think the important starting point is to understand what's the difference between this internet versus the internet or the internets that we're familiar with. Um, and there's some very important key differentiators. The first is that it's stateful. And so we can represent states and state changes over time, which is critically important for any development process because development processes take place over time. And um, if we can create representations of the state of the world in a stateful record, um, then we can start to link what's happening in the real world with what's happening in our cybernetic system. Um, so the statefulness of, of these networks and of, uh, of this internet is really important. Um, the second thing is the programmability. So if we're able to program uh, triggers and, uh, and processes that, uh, that run as a result of state changes and we link those state changes to what's happening in the real world, then we can make changes to the state on chain, which can have effects such as um, repricing or triggering outcome payments um, and results payments and so on. But that can have a powerful effect on influencing what happens in the real world. And so when we get this um, cyber physical connection, if we've got a good uh, way of connecting the users and the data with the um, financing mechanisms, then we've got an incredibly powerful machinery to be able to change state, to change the state of the real world. Uh, the, the, the third characteristic of this is, um, is that it's graph-based. You know? So we've got the, um, the, the, the DAG graph, so that, that kind of forward-moving, directed, um, acyclic graph of the, um, of the chain, but we can also embed um, semantic web linked data graphs. And this is really important if we're trying to create a a ledger um, that is representing a full picture of what's going on. We need to link all the data points together. Mm. Now, for privacy reasons, and, um, and also because not all the data is on chain, this means needing to have a really powerful metadata model. And this gets us to kind of where, where we have um, most recently been innovating around NFTs and the metadata models around NFTs using decentralized identifiers, did documents, linked data, et cetera. 
Um, and so, uh, and then I guess the fourth um, characteristic of these is the sovereignty and decentralized nature. And uh, it, it was evident to me like very early on uh, embarking on these technology developments that it wasn't gonna cut it having some um, you know, prime chain that um, you know, governments and, and corporations and so on would not all buy into the same chain in terms of governance and economy. And so we needed to have a multi-chain um, and sovereign way of configuring this. And so the promise of IBC was always something that was like a really important thing for us. And the idea of an internet, internet of blockchains um, in terms of like then being able to create an internet of impact um, was, was, was very compelling. Uh, it wasn't really, I guess, until we saw that happen that I felt very confident to be able to say, yep, this is what we're building an internet of impact. Um, and uh, so really what makes this different from an internet of blockchains is, I guess, kind of taking the um, application specific ideology of Cosmos chains and saying, okay, here we've got a set of chains or networks of chains that are specifically purposed towards sustainability and ecological regeneration. You know, and when we start to link those together, we link an exo chain, we link a regen chain. There's a lot of similarities. They're running a lot of the same uh, modules and same data models and so on. So now we can start to create interoperability and we can start to have a real internet. And uh, you know, for now, that's going to be a set of networks that is purposed in that way. But our vision is that these principles come into all of the networks. And, and this is an important part of um, the interchain program uh, vision that, you know, that we're setting out to implement is to orient all of the application chains within Cosmos towards this sustainability vision and to understand how you can bring components of that into your application layer um, and, your, and, your, and your base layer. Um, so whether that's around uh, zero emissions networks or interoperability in terms of data standards, um, tokenization, NFTs, et cetera. Once we've got this interoperability, you know, I should be able to trade a carbon token uh, on, a, on a gaming uh, 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 network. Uh, you know, that, that, should not, that should be completely trivial. And once we get that, we're then providing a substrate, a digital layer for a whole new economy. And, and it is not a sort of sub-economy. It starts off as a sub-economy of um, the economy, the way that we've got to know it. Um, but it actually has the potential to become the mainstream economy. And it's essential actually for us to have that vision and work towards that vision to achieve sustainability. You know, the economy as we know it, the, um, the messed up economy that you know, is, is uh, not sustainable and that's really creating all of the, the problems in the world um, needs to be replaced by something. And so what is it? What's the best candidate for this? And, and what technology does that run on? So one thing that um i always kind of like ask myself and also a lot of people have you know i have talked with a lot of people about this um whenever you kind of like have to deal with the real world with external you know uh, uh, world um and that's also what you guys are trying to um build right to kind of like disrupt also um current um kind of like farms and the way we create and, and use energy and to kind of like also reduce uh, the carbon emissions and those kind of things um but the thing is always how do you make sure that we get um, um, we have we preserve this data integrity, right? So that we don't have false data. Because as soon as you have false data coming into the system on like in the first step, then the whole system itself is is flawed, right? So how do you resolve this kind of like original um, oracle problem? Um, and how um, yeah, how far are you in that process already? Do you have already like case studies mm -hmm. with ranches and farms or? How, how are we there right now? Yeah, so um, so there's there there's there are a few different angles to this. It's, you know, there's not just one set of oracles. So I think the first is um, that we've put out an idea that hopefully takes the whole idea of blockchain oracles forward, which is that blockchain oracles aren't just sources of trusted information. You know, kind of which is kind of where where the the original idea of oracles um, has been implemented. You know, so if you go back to the original um, Oracle of Delphi, um, sitting on the mountain, people would come there to ask questions and say, you know, did this happen in history? And the Oracle would say yes or no or whatever. But mostly people would go there to ask for predictions. What's going to happen next year? Are we going to have a good season with um, planting our crops and so on? 
And so this predictive um, uh, function of oracles is incredibly important. And it's also incredibly, has incredible potential given our data applications, AI, machine learning, and so on. Um, and if we have enough structured data in the right formats with the right incentives for sharing the data and passing it through these systems in systematic ways, we're, in a, we're able to um, train the, uh, the prediction um, oracles to become better and better at, at predicting. Um, so that's one part of it is the prediction oracles. And when you look at the prediction functions, I like to talk about P functions because they all happen to be all kind of starting with the letter P. Um, and uh, the original idea from this came for this came from <clears throat> from precision medicine. So pre precision medicine is personalized, it's preventive, it's predictive, um, and it's participatory. So there's your first four P's. But you can add to this proofing, um, prescription. Uh, um, uh, there's, a, there's like ten P's. Um, and and this um, <clears throat> this is a very powerful ideology in terms of the economy that you can create around it because each of those is a service that adds value to data and that adds value to um, the users of the system, whether they're investors or, or project implementers or whatever. Um, and so we've built the machinery around how to create these Oracle services that do prediction. <clears throat> now, um, it starts with tapping into the existing marketplace of services that uh, you employ to evaluate information or evaluate a state and give you some kind of results on that. So there's already huge uh, um, uh, marketplaces around, for instance, you know, carbon uh, verification, project verification. There's huge marketplaces around identity verification. And so there's these legacy service providers and legacy ways of doing things. But if we can now bring them into more of a data-driven, sem semantically defined, um, standardized data, uh, um, uh, system which also has the incentives for people to put the data through and and the and the the the, the guarantees based on cryptography and um, um, uh, and and there's some some cool advances in in, in that area as well. Um, then then we can start to use trusted data sets and do the training in in that way. The other category of um, of oracles is we call them alpha oracles. So alpha is a measure. Um, a predictive measure, uh, typically within financial markets, and it's used a lot within the impact sector, where you're predicting an outcome. Um, so impact alpha would be, you know, are you going to get um, more in an education program, more children who reach their educational outcomes for the dollar per dollar um, in program A or program B? So program A would have a better alpha. And so seeking alpha is a really important thing for impact investors. And um, and uh, for capital allocators everywhere, really, it's 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 about how do you get the best results for your money, and so how do we pick up that alpha? Well, a big part of it is besides building on the predictive power of the data coming through, but a big part of it is the beliefs of the people who are vested in the system, and so um, if you have a um, a bunch of analysts um, who are predicting the increase or decrease in a stock price. And they've all got some kind of skin in the game, or they're um, they're they're in it to to um, to try and beat the market with their predictions. Um, they rely on a whole bunch of different sources of information to come up with that prediction, and then with a price prediction, for instance. And so we've built this into the protocol um, where we have an alpha oracle, um, and we, we haven't actually built this module yet, but we've done all the research with uh, Block Science um, with Michael Zargam and his team. Um, around a, um, a prediction um, 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 uh, module, which um, enables people and incentivizes people who are invested in a bond, for instance, to reveal their, their private beliefs of alpha. And the way that we do this is essentially we run an internal prediction market. And so mm -hmm. if, you're, if, you are, um, if you're successful in predicting the outcome, then you will get paid out um, a share of those who predicted that it wasn't success, that it wouldn't be successful, and so you, you, you know, typical prediction market type um, setup. Um, but uh, it's a dynamic process; it's not a one-time prediction. And so you're able to incentivize people to put in predictions at points in time, and they deterministically um, uh, update the uh, the prior prediction of alpha with future value. So it's like a Bayesian um, progression. 
And at any point in time, you will have a prediction that feeds back into the bonding curve and adjusts the shape of the curve, the, 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 um, the, the algorithm. And so whereas bonding curves in, in the way that most people understand them uh, with token bonding curves are fixed curves and you have to decide a priori, you know, wh what, is the, um, what is the curve shape? What are the parameters of the curve? With uh, risk adjusted bonding curves, which we've implemented in the Cosmos SDK, um, you have an alpha value which comes in and that adjusts the, the bonding curve. So you can imagine the curve kind of goes backwards or forwards depending on how likely it is that that bond is going to be to pay out in future. Um, now, this is a really, a really powerful primitive. I mean, in, in, in themselves, uh, bonding curves are an incredibly powerful idea um, about how to connect the real world with, uh, with, the, with the blockchain world because it provides an interface. Um, it's like the uh, accelerator on your car. Uh, in your car, you know, that's an interface between between you and your perception of how fast you're going and what the, what the conditions are um, and the engine of your car, which is making it go at a certain speed. Um, so you have an interface and you have a dashboard. And so bonding curves are kind of like that. They're control mechanisms, but they should be adjustable. Um, and so when we get this pricing feedback loop, uh, we're able to get much more fine-tuned um, pricing on the bond. So at any point when you're doing um, buys and sells in and out of the AMM, uh, you'll get a different price depending on that alpha. And then, as I said earlier, um, this can then influence people's behaviors because if the price is going down <clears throat> and you're the project implementer or the price is going down and you're the investor, it's going to lead you to take certain actions, either to course correct if, the, if you're the project um, implementer or as the, as the investor, maybe to pull out and sell out your position which would bring other investors in who may then be more motivated to, um, to influence the project implementers to, uh, to improve their performance. Um, and so this provides a really important way of uh, monitoring the success of an investment system within a systems context. Yeah. So the difference here between um, these kinds of mechanisms, which we call sustainable and regenerative DeFi mechanisms or refi mechanisms, and just... Uh, you know, vanilla DeFi is that they're linked to state, uh, to state that is that is uh, in, in the real world. So if you've got a way of translating the state of, state of the real world into a blockchain uh, state uh, uh, record, and then you build your DeFi off of that, then we can start doing things that are very powerful that have an impact on the real world and vice versa. And, and that is also then what you um, call sustainable DeFi, right? Is that the major part of it? or? Yeah, so, so, um, so what I've been putting the idea out about is, is that we need, to, um, we need to make this differentiation between DeFi, which is in a closed loop system most, mostly. You know, if, we, if we look at most of what DeFi does, it's, yeah, um, it's, it's kind of playing games on, on the blockchain. Um, and yes, of course, it does have some impact in the real world, but um, it's linked more to the gamers rather than other parts of the real world that I think are much more relevant and important for certainly for sustainability and ecological regeneration. And so um, if we want to get that connection with the real world, we, we need to have this mechanism of recording state. And so, um, so let's differentiate between the, the DeFi mechanisms, which aren't linked to, to real world states and those that are. And so that's where we talk about sustainable. Um, because it, it's it, in order to be sustainable, you know, if if things in the real world are not sustainable, if you're getting information back from the real world that says this isn't working, then it should reflect in what's happening on chain. Um, and so, um, sustain sustainability is really about um, operating within a system, within a complex adaptive system, which is the real world. And the only way you can navigate a complex adaptive system is by having information feedback loops. Um, and if you've got good loops going going around, then you can sustain. Um, and and the same would apply, you know, just as you know, we're we're talking about um, like sustainability use cases in the sort of traditional paradigm of what is sustainability. But the same could apply to um, the sustainability of a DAO, you know, sustainability of a, of a community or sustainability of a company. Um, you can use exactly the same mechanisms, and so it opens up the possibilities for a whole range of 
you know, um, of uh, financial and non-financial applications, governance applications and so on, built on these primitives. And I'm you know, particularly excited about the potential to take these set of primitives and implement them in different uh, use case applications. Yeah, and you already mentioned um, sustainable DAOs, and I think the um, Earth state is also playing a major role in that because it's kind of like, as, as far as I understand, um, a communication platform where members can come together and uh, think and maybe start new projects or evaluate projects and also help contribute. So um, can you explain a little bit about um, the Earth state and also um, end users can um, become members there there's a monthly, I think, monthly fee for it. Uh, so can you talk a little bit about uh, what the Earth state is and what the kind of like membership um, means and what kind of like outcome you um, wish that this platform uh, brings? Yeah, so the, the, the Earth state is a new um, information sharing and intelligence platform um, starting off um, you know, with, a, with a sort of fairly modest um, goal to to just start getting regular information well curated information and some original analysis and so on um to share information about what's happening within this space and this space being sustainable and regenerative uh, uh, DeFi, as well as um, the tokenized impact economy um, so most people are not really familiar what with what those terms mean and and so we wanting to firstly educate to demystify, have conversations around it. I'm not saying we have all the answers, you know, so, so have a place where we can um, discuss these things and have thought leadership um, and examples and reflect on what's happening within the broader space, which may not even define itself as being connected to this, but by, by creating a focus and, um, and, a, and a, a platform, um, we're hoping to kind of bring a lot of information together. The intelligence side of it, is where we start to delve down deeper into specific areas of analytics, so whether that's market analysis around, um, around a specific token, like let's say the regen token, you know, let's look at, look at that in the way that um, you know, tokens are analyzed in DeFi, um, but with a lens that says, okay, what does this mean for uh, this, new, this new economy? Um, uh, and then uh, we, we anticipate there being a huge amount of deal flow that will start coming through these systems with all kinds of interesting projects, new DAOs, new, new impact token issuances. Um, and so, you know, who are the people who are going to be the first to know about this and where are you going to find out about it? So let's, let's create a place that people can come to, um, make it member driven, um, make it incentivized that people participate, but also, you know, have a, have, expect people to put something into it. And so you know, the easy way of starting this was to say, well, there's a subscription fee, um, but that's not necessarily something we're, we're, um, we're tied to. It's just, a, it's just an entry point. There may be many other ways and hope, hopefully moving into more tokenized uh, mechanisms where people can participate maybe through having a stake, for instance, um, and, and then getting um, free access to this. And it's, it's, it's really not about trying to um, have a paywall or anything like that. It's really, it's really to try and get people staked and to be to feel like stakeholders and to get the benefits of this. And um, I'm I'm always focused on if you're going to pay for something or if you're going to invest time into something, be sure that you know that you're going to get a return on that. And uh, because otherwise, it's just not worth it. You're not going to stick around. It's not sustainable. Um, so that's that's kind of where we're going with that. The first edition comes out uh, this week, Friday. Um, of the Earth State Briefing, which is a weekly briefing, um, which we hope will really grow to become a very enjoyable read, but also something that if you receive it, you're getting information before anyone else in the market, and you know, and you can you can act on it, and it can be something that really um, drives your information, uh, um, your learning, and your you. So you can become an expert in mm. in this new in this new area. Yeah, definitely. I think everybody, anybody who is interested in um, kind of like ecological impact and how crypto and blockchain, right, it's, it's very kind of like money driven, it's very APY driven these days, right. But I think um, I know personally, a lot of people and including myself, um, a lot of people that are actually thinking beyond just that, right. And sure, we all love, you know, to make money in crypto and speculate on <laughs> ticker prices and coin prices, that's all fine and fun. But I think um, we're seeing now actually, 
crypto, I think, at least the way I see it, is like we're at the verge to really having an impact on many industries, not just finance, but also the way we yeah. um, transfer data and ownership, right? So, so many things. I mean, NFTs are blowing up for a reason as well, right? Sure, there's a lot of heat right now, a lot of noise, but I think also it, it proves that, hey, you can actually prove digital ownership and intellectual property, right? And, and so many things. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's really, really cool. Um, and we're, by the way, also going to speak about this in a second because you're also um, implementing an, an NFT module or feature in that whole platform. Um, but before we do that, I would like to uh, talk a little bit about the um, partnership landscape. Um, you also have a partnership with Region Network. Um, anybody who don't know, uh, who doesn't know what Region is and does, I made a one one and a half hour <laughs> conversation with Gregory Landua, the uh, founder and CEO. Um, so, can you talk a little bit about the partnerships here, and then also the partners that you already have onboarded and that you run pilots with currently um, to use the the ledger and and use the platform? Yeah, great. So, um, so the there. Are um, the network partners, I guess, I guess if we start, there's, there's different categories of partners. So network partners where there's aligned networks who, um, in this vision of uh, internet of impact, um, would be networks that all plug into this bigger internet. Um, and uh, the relationships that have been formed, like with the team at Region, um, with, with Christian and, and Gregory, go back to when we were really struggling a few years ago as a new project. Um, trying to sell this idea and everyone was going, well, sustainability, what's that? Of course, the world has changed in the last four or five years. And I think particularly with the, um, the, with the, the COVID pandemic last year, you know, a lot of people's thinking has changed. And, um, and so, so this has brought us to a point now where, you know, now we're having our day. But we formed these relationships years ago and um, have um, worked together on the advocacy and community building and trying to convince people. And so, so it's great to have, you know, have come through that struggle together and now be at a place where we're, um, we're, we're each playing very complementary roles and, uh, and within the Cosmos ecosystem in terms of contributions to the, the core code base and uh, uh, mechanisms and communities within, within, um, within Cosmos. We've done a token swap um, between Regen and, and XO, um, really to solidify that and to signal to people that there's a new mode of cooperation or of working together. You know, this is a does not have to be a competitive space. Um, uh, you know, competition is good, but we need cooperation and collaboration. And by being able to link our networks together and use the common open source um, technologies and so on, it provides the potential for that. And the the network effects and are you know are non zero sum the economy is huge the potential is amazing there's a huge amount of work to be done so region network is a very close um, partner and ally of ours um, then we we've worked with um, irisnet and we have announced a partnership with irisnet as well um, they've been very active participants in our um, uh, our working group um, on nfts and metadata um, and have done the lead implementation of the Cosmos SDK NFT module um, and, uh, and are very interested in applying uh, those standards and, the, and using, using the technology within the context of enterprises and carbon markets. Um, so bringing some of the enterprise um, integrations they have uh, and the privacy technologies that they have. Um, then uh, outside of the Cosmos chain um, partnerships, there's a range of partners um, who are very aligned and, uh, and we are part of those communities like the Common Stack, for instance. A Common Stack is building um, a set of um, technologies around uh, governance and managing uh, an economy and managing the commons. Uh, so for instance, open source projects is, a, is an obvious one, but extending into all of the things which are therefore all of us to benefit from and which generally have been underfunded. So this can include natural commons um, and, and so on. And so how do we govern them? How do we fund them? Uh, so Common Stack is a very, um, a very close uh, partner of ours. And then we've got some technical partnerships like with um, Block Science, who does uh, crypto economic engineering. Um, and this partnership um, model is, is now growing and there's opportunities to 
um, bring in more partners um, through the program that we have just started implementing with the Interchain Foundation. Um, so uh, I can speak a little bit about that if, if you like, because I think that's, sure, a, yeah, that's yeah. a pretty yeah. exciting. Would love to. Yeah. So, um, so we've been working closely with the Interchain Foundation on, on some of the core um, Cosmos um, uh, technology. So I've mentioned uh, the, the work we've done on bonding curves and um, and the bonds module, and then uh, on NFTs and, and the metadata standards around that, decentralized identifiers, et cetera. Um, but I, I started having a conversation with, with the ICF team uh, around a year ago uh, when IBC was looking like it was going to really launch. And, and I posed the question, you know, so we're going to have an internet of blockchains, but for what? You know, is this an internet of block, blockchains to just replicate DeFi that's currently kind of the you know, craze on, on Ethereum or to, you know, recreate the systems that we have had in the past? Or do we say this is a unique, a uniquely positioned ecosystem that um, could make this internet of blockchains purposed towards sustainability, but to do that in a very um, intentional way and to support it with funding and to support it with, with the influence of the Interchain Foundation. And so where we've got to is that we, we now have formally, uh, tomorrow night we'll formally launch um, the Interchain Earth Program. And the Earth, Interchain Earth Program is a multi-year commitment by the ICF um, with a decent um, funding budget um, to support the research and development and advocacy and education and so on around these technologies. So um, continuing to build the core um, software and protocols and so on within Cosmos that will enable um, greater adoption of sustainability um, use cases and applications, um, such as uh, local currency systems, um, which um, it's Ethan is, 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 is really a, a, a hugely um, a huge fan of and, and, and a huge advocate for. Um, zero emissions blockchains, um, um, digital identity and data sovereignty, all of these things come together uh, to provide the building blocks for this new economy. Um, now, the other thing that, that has kind of put wind in the sails of this initiative is that last year, just around this time, August last year, um, the UN Task Force on Digital Finance for the Sustainable Development Goals, it's a very long name, um, so there's a special task force that was set up under the UN Secretary General's office to look at the potential of digital finance to be a way of, of mobilizing more capital towards sustainability to try and achieve these goals by 2030. So there's the 17 UN sustainability goals, the global goals, which really sort of encompass all of the, the different sectors and, and parts of the um, economy and, and, and so on that are relevant to sustainability, everything from life below you know, the waters and sea to education, to uh, sustainable infrastructure, energy, et cetera. So climate change, so it's all in there. Um, but there's not enough momentum yet. Um, so the people's, the, um, the task force uh, uh, um, published a report called People's Money. And so after the work that they had done over um, a period of a year or so, um, they came to the conclusion that the thing that's going to most shift the needle in terms of shifting us towards a sustainable future is giving ordinary citizens the tools to be able to know how to spend their money, invest their money, and pay taxes in a way that they hold governments accountable because of uh, transparency and accountability and data and so on. And if, we, if we're able to establish a um, mainstream adoption of these technologies that gives people the power and the tools to do this, that's really going to be what the game changer will will um, you know will, will be, and so the question then is well okay so we we've we're building all of these data and uh, uh, financing technologies within uh, Cosmos and and the broader blockchain um, uh, kind of uh, universe. Um, so how can we be sure that they're actually meeting this people's money agenda and sustainability agenda? Well, we need to be intentional about it. We need to have a program. We need to have research and development. We need to have partnerships. And so that's where we are now, launching this initiative, which is super exciting. And um, you know, I have the honor of, of being uh, asked by the Interchain Foundation to lead on this and to form the team. And we've got an amazing team of people from across the world um, who are part of the core team. And then we have great partners and so on. So we'll, we'll have the launch event around that tomorrow. 
Um, in terms of other use cases, building specifically on Exo, so we've got a, <clears throat> a model where um, we're trying to link the validator nodes to what we call market relayers. And market relayers are organizations that are building the platforms that deliver products and services and connect um, the, um, the, the impact economies within specific sectors or within specific geographies. Um, and so we're, we're busy rolling out um, the validator network. I think we, you know, we, so we, we did our Stargate upgrade, um, I think it was like two or three weeks back um, and um, um, our, our token um, issuance is coming up um, really soon. And so that validator network is setting up and we've got validators in places where there already are these market relayers who are delivering um, uh, solutions into these marketplaces. I'll give you three examples. So in Hong Kong, we, um, we have um, the Impact Data Consortium chain, um, which is working with the Hong Kong government's uh, Social Innovation and Entrepreneurship Fund um, to provide capacity building and to onboard 500 organizations that receive some form of government funding um, within the social sector. So this is everything from Alzheimer's research to organizations that are providing, you know, uh, growing, growing food gardens and things like that. Um, so bringing all of those organizations um, to have an identity, to start making claims, um, and then providing them with the tools to do the funding. And the next phase of that is, is to implement uh, um, a, uh, a local currency scheme linked to time banking projects, and then it will roll from there. Um, the second example is, is our educational technologies um, a market relayer uh, in India. Um, and there we have a multi-year project with a global financial institution, a Swiss institution, um, that uh, has provided us with a research and development grant to implement um, alpha bonds or um, yeah, the, uh, uh, the, the, the bonds mechanism for outcomes-based financing um, for education. And so that project went live a couple of weeks ago. Um, it's a pilot in which 500 households have received tablet devices um, for the children to, to learn to read and write um, and learn mathematics. Um, so uh, digital uh, um, uh, literacy, math literacy, literacy over a period of 12 months. It's financed by the bank and feeds into this alpha bond mechanism. Mm -hmm. And the data coming off of the tablets um, goes through the alpha oracle um, and does the adjustment on the pricing. So um, that's a pilot. It's our initial rollout there, but the ambition is to then take that across India and other places um, and really provide a, a very scalable mechanism um, to, um, to finance results-based outcomes in education. So around that, there's the potential to build the whole economy um, for education and then going on to lifelong learning and so on. So that, that's the ambition of, of the organization that's running that uh, called Chimbo. Um, the, the third one, which is just getting off the ground, which, I'm, which is extremely exciting because it's very close to home here in South Africa, um, is called YOMA, the Youth Marketplace, which is an initiative with um, UNICEF Africa and a whole bunch of other partners, um, which uh, is intending to get um, millions of youths in, 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 in Africa um, to get self-sovereign digital, digital identity and then... Um, uh, receive credentials for training and skills development. So you build up a digital CV using SSI and verifiable credentials, and then link into um, opportunities for work, particularly focused in the green economy. So that's to work on projects or businesses, or set up your own business with entrepreneurship um, uh, support, uh, funding support, and so on. Um, so a very, a very big uh, and ambitious uh, program, but with huge potential because of the um, you know, the large numbers of youth and youth, of, of course, being, being, being sort of digitally native. Um, so it's got incredible potential. So those are some of the examples, but we'll see many, many more examples of these platforms building out. Um, uh, it'll be quite exciting to see the, the ones that come onto our launch pad. So within a couple of weeks time on the XO, uh, XO World website, um, using our web application, we have a dog fooding process where firstly, um, we're providing a platform for organizations who want to launch into the marketplace to come and uh, pitch um, uh, on, on, the, on the website. Um, and uh, we'll have a voting campaign around that where you can stake your XO tokens and receive a yield uh, if you um, successfully 
uh, uh, vote for candidates that then receive the threshold number of votes. So that's using our um, our alpha bond mechanism. Um, so there's there's a pricing curve that if you come in later, you get less of a share of the outcome payment. Um, and so it incentivizes people to get in early and uh, to have conviction. Um, and then it uses the outcome payment mechanism that if there's success, then um, tokens will go into the reserve of the bonding curve and at settlement, everyone takes out you know, up to 20% yield on the, on the vote. Um, so that's going to provide a lot of visibility for the types of marketplace platforms that are building out on this, uh, on this internet, um, as well as a mechanism for people to really get directly involved as stakeholders initially by signaling and participating in the voting, but then as those, um, as those uh, uh, market relayers set up validated nodes or partner with validated nodes to then stake into those validated nodes and become part of the staked community. You know, and so our vision is that the people who are staked into the XO um, network or the impact hub, um, which is our, 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 our main net uh, currently, um, will, will, will be active participants and stakeholders in the true sense. You know, so they'll be supporting the project. They'll be interested in what's happening there. And they'll have the opportunity to do the work as defined by staking your tokens so that you help secure the network. But potentially the staking token can offer you other um, benefits and access and other rights to participate in those, uh, in those um, uh, marketplaces. And I think one of the best ways to kind of like build this um, sophisticated environment is also through something like the, the Earth State or the Earth Program, right? I think one of the major success factors probably from um, osmosis um, that went live two and a half months ago is that they have this like very kind of a gamified where, way you know where every every day at for me here at 6 p.m we all log in you know we claim our rewards we do this and that we play around with it but it's a place where everybody kind of comes together and then we talk about it we exchange strategy ideas and those kind of things and i think um, what I like about your your guys approach is that you're not just focusing on one thing and you go deep in it you're trying to tackle many things at the same time but you're also trying to do it the right way right so building this community is super important having mindful tokenomics and um, we can talk about this in a second very very important onboarding the right partners and you mentioned region network the interchain foundation right in this whole ideological sense um, Gregory also um, I loved how he how he phrases it is that we out cooperate the competition. I love that. Yes. So I think that the kind of like ideology and that approach is um, going to be very, very, um, yeah, sustainable in the long run as well. Um, and one thing you also pointed out is kind of like the whole, um, when, when you said earlier that, um, yeah, cool, Cosmos wants to become the internet of blockchains, but how do we actually do this, right? It's cool to have this as a slogan, but how do we actually do this? Um, and I can already see different hubs on the on cosmos on the cosmoverse right where you have one that is DeFi, and then you have all the zones packed to DeFi. then you have the impact hub potentially and all kind of like sustainability and environment ecological stuff packed to this then we need a social hub we probably need um, an nft hub and and all those kind of things so i think we're at the beginning of this but um, i can slowly kind of like see and sense that you know we're actually somehow potentially getting there um, which is really cool and another thing that you also said, I think is super important, is to basically um, hold the public accountable um, and not just politicians. I think it's also about, you know, everybody's always, oh, yeah, the politicians are um, promising mm -hmm. us things and they don't do it. You know, they have all these um, ambitious targets to decrease uh, carbon emissions and improve the environment and this and that. Um, but then they never achieve it. And, and, and as, as citizens, you know, who just chill at home and watch on TV what they say, and then we complain about it, I think um, it's also not sustainable, right? Because we can actually do something about it. We can actually kind of like raise our voice, build something like what you're doing um, and, and come together there. And then we actually also can have an impact. Um, and the more people join, the more impact we have. So a lot of, a lot of interesting things. I just wanted to recap that because I think it's very, very important um, for people also to understand and also for myself um, to, to understand this. Um, maybe we can go to the last kind of like um, part of this conversation because we're almost at an hour and I feel like we're just getting started. <laughs> but so let's talk a little bit about the, um, the token models. As of my understanding, there's two tokens. 
One is kind of like the XO token that you already said, it's like the staking native token. And then there's also going to be liquidity pools on um, Cosmos DEXs like the Gravity DEX and Osmosis. But then there's also a whole NFT part to it, which in my understanding, um, and you can obviously expand on that, is uh, going to be part in this, uh, also what you just mentioned, the, the launch pads, right? Where people can create projects, get funding, and then um, you mint an NFT that represents that project. And then the more people invest, the more valuable that NFT gets. Is that correct or? Um, that's, 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 that, yeah, that's, that's partly correct. Um, and that's, that's one of the use cases. So um, what, what we've been working on is, is the, um, the standard in the protocol for, for anybody to be able to uh, mint an NFT that represents some kind of state, uh, generally outcome states, you know, so, in the example that you used, you know, if the project is successful and it, let's say it's a it's a physical building that gets built, um, that everyone who has ownership in the NFT, which is representing the building that was built or the farm that was um, grown, the crop that was grown, whatever, the IP that was created, um, has a participation in that represented by the NFT. Um, just having uh, ownership of a digital asset is not enough, though. Um, the 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 digital asset needs to represent a whole lot of other resources that are um, useful and important, such as the, the actual claims and the credentials and um, the information that backs up the thing that you're invested in. Um, and then uh, and then needs to have some rights associated with it. So for instance, if we all own a share of a, a token which represents a, a new, um, uh, a, a new sustainable building, for instance, a, a, a um, sustainable building office block, let's say, um, then who has the right to now create um, uh, fungible tokens which represent access tokens, for instance, they know you need to go and use that building. Um, so you can start to embed these rights into the, into the tokens and you can start to use tokens for representing any outcome state that people are willing to work towards, um, invest in, uh, purchase, um, or have any interest in. And so just like this mind shift around what is an outcome state. Now, if we look at the world and you say, well, I want to see this, I want to be able to see something, experience something, you know, uh, someone who's educated, um, a, a park that is clean, um, uh, whatever it is. Um, and if we can codify that in a way that it's backed by data and it's embedded with rights, then we can start doing incredibly powerful things from a DeFi perspective, but also linking into the systems and processes that we have in the real world. You know, so it may, it may come with legal rights, it may come with access rights and all those kinds of things. And so our understanding and our belief in, um, in NFTs is that you know, they are incredibly important that pretty much everything will be represented by some sort of um, digital representation and that we've got to get it right at this stage. And so the link between that and the standard that we've worked on, which is called the interchain identifier standard, um, is, is the uh, set of standards that have been developed at the World Wide Web Consortium around digital identity, um, where the focus has mostly been on digital identity for people and organizations. Um, but the, the vision is that, you know, that every person, everything has got an identity that can be represented and um, validated and verified um, in a transactional realm, in a blockchain realm, et cetera, uh, in the internet, uh, in the World Wide Web. And so um, if we can extend that to include not just the subjective things, so this is about me, my organization, et cetera, but objective ob observations about the state of the world, and we can solidify that information in a way that it becomes tokenized. We can start to do incredibly powerful things with that. We can build it into all kinds of transactions, um, collateralization mechanisms, participation mechanisms, et cetera, et cetera. It's really the foundation. It's, the, it's digitizing the real world and making it transactable and composable within the digital world. Awesome, yeah, that's, that's very, very cool. Um, and also one of the... Um, coolest ways, especially for cosmonauts and, you know, uh, people in the DeFi ecosystem, is that there, there's um, a bunch of uh, airdrops um, as uh, people can either become a member and then they can get, get an airdrop. Or um, I think there's also one, um, that's actually the one that I also signed up for, um, to stake um, your region 
um, coins and then you would also get an airdrop. So can you talk a little bit about the airdrops and anybody who is listening to this right now, obviously this is also time sensitive content. So in a couple of months, this is uh, over. Um, what, what, what are the airdrops and what's the purpose of them? And um, what can users do who say now like, hey man, I want to get involved in this early on. What's the best way to kind of like get started and maybe even receive initial kind of like XO coins to, to play around with? Yeah. So the, so the first um, phase of the airdrops, which was to partner networks, was really about activating those networks to become firstly aware of, 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 of our um, Impact Hub and the work that we're doing as Internet of Impact. Um, and the, the launch of the Earth State uh, platform, um, and then to give them a significant enough stake that you would feel like you're a stakeholder. You know, so the more people who we who we have in the world who feel like they actually have a stake in this new economy and in, and in these new networks and ideas and things, you know, the, the more we can uh, accelerate the the movement around it. Um, and so our airdrop was was really quite generous, um, 500 exo tokens, and um, our um, our target listing price is around one dollar twenty. Um, so, yeah, it's a, it's a pretty generous um, and meaningful um, way for people to come in, and we wanted to make sure that it was at least targeted the best we could make it for uh, towards communities that um, already have shown their alignment with projects that are uh, kind of mission aligned, like Region Network and so on, um, a common stack and so on. Um, so that, that phase is over, um, uh, and uh, unfortunately, no more, no more free free tokens um, for for partners. But we're still continuing until we have reached the the cap um, with uh, a token drop of a thousand X. So for anyone who signs up to the Earth States um, platform, um, and uh, you know, so again, that gives you firstly access to this information platform, which we think is really, really important with the motivation to come there and sign up and be part of it, um, as well as the incentive and reward to then have the tokens and then start using the tokens, but, um, delegating into the network, uh, looking at the validators who are there. And there's some validators who are new validators to the ecosystem, to the Cosmos ecosystem, um, who are implementing some of these projects like the, the ones I mentioned, like Impact Data Consortium, um, the, the EdTech um, um, uh, validator in India and so on. So there's new participants into the network. So learn about them, stake on them, uh, delegate to them. Um, and then you can also use your tokens in the voting campaigns and earn yields on, on that. Um, so yeah, we've got a lot of plans going ahead. Um, we wanna get more and more people um, staked into it, both from the existing Cosmos community, as well as people who, for the first time, they're receiving tokens and now they're getting their entry point into a whole you know, new world of blockchains and token economies. And uh, that's been particularly cool to see because you know, we put it out to friends and family and networks and, and people have said, wow, for the first time, I actually have some tokens and I kind of am really excited about this. Um, uh, and generally, the experience of getting their wallets and things wasn't too bad. Um, the, the best... Uh, the best comment I got from a friend was uh, when she got her mnemonic, she said, uh, I couldn't have made up a better stripper name if I tried. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that's funny. Yeah. But yeah, I also uh, tried, uh, played around with it a little bit. It's actually very also, yeah, intuitive and, um, and easy to create your your first, uh, your Earth Earth wallet or a state wallet, I think it's called. Um, but anyway, um, I think we can wrap it up here um yeah i i'll link everything obviously under under this video also for people that want to become part of the community um so yeah thank you so much for your time um uh, maybe yeah. uh, you can share some final thoughts on kind of like the most exciting things that you're looking forward to in the next um two three four weeks um and then uh, yeah we can wrap it up here yeah so this i i i'd love to just to do that and just to kind of have a have a final thought so um so in the in the next two three weeks, so tomorrow we've got we've got the launch of um, of the Interchain Earth program. Um, we've got some big announcements coming up about um, significant partnerships um, that are in the works. So uh, look out for that. Um, launching on the uh, Cosmos Dex uh, with Emirates, and and then we're look, we're, we're looking to Osmosis as well um, with uh, within the launch pad uh, for the Internet of Impact with all the projects coming on the voting campaigns, etc. Um, we've got product releases, we've got a, a mobile wallet that's in the works. Um, so yeah, there's a, there's a huge amount happening. 
Um, so yeah, please get involved and be part of the community and um, also look for ways in which you can use the technology because it's, it's, it's there, it's kind of working and uh, it's available to start running projects and things. Um, and just on the, on the last note, I was just thinking back to um, when I was a kid, I, uh, back in the dark days of South Africa, um, I was glued to the set, uh, the TV, um, for this program called Cosmos, which was um, Carl Sagan. I don't know if you remember that, maybe a little bit before your time, but, um, uh, but uh, Carl Sagan um, had this uh, TV series called uh, Cosmos, which was a personal voyage, and um, spoke about Cosmos in terms of our, our understanding of our place in the universe, I guess. Um, but super fascinating, and it really got me into uh, like being excited about science and about um, technology and so on. And uh, this was in 1980. And at the end of episode one, he said, this is a time of great danger, but we have the power to decide our fate of our planet and ourselves. And our, our science and technology have posed us profound questions. Uh, will we learn to use these tools with wisdom and foresight before it's too late? And our future depends powerfully on how well we understand this cosmos and the journey for each of us begins here. Now, so that was super inspiring and so i find myself you know beautifully within this cosmos ecosystem and with the opportunity to lead this journey and um, form partnerships and friends and so really looking forward to where we go from here um it's a super exciting adventure to be on yeah that's awesome and i'm also looking forward to keep track of everything and maybe you know one day we can have um, a show also together with gregory i think um, this would be really cool since you are also collaborating and out cooperating the competition, the competition in that sense being potentially, you know, the traditional mm -hmm. ways how we used used to do things. But I think now it's time for for something different, something new, and to do, have crazy ideas um, that actually also work, right? And crypto and blockchain and dis, uh, distributed ledger technology, in my opinion, is one of the most revolutionary technologies that can actually have a giant, giant impact. Um, that goes way beyond, like we said, um, you know, trading and, and chasing APYs. So yeah, uh, we'll keep in touch. Uh, obviously, um, thank you so much for your time, and wish you all the best for the launch tomorrow. And um, yeah, looking forward to do this again sometime. Yeah, excellent, wonderful. I look forward to being in Lisbon later in the year. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, we'll, we'll uh, have a great time here. It's a it's a great place as well. You'll love it. <laughs> great. Thanks so much. Take care. Bye bye.